guys like One Piece? Check that, check that right the red line. Is yeah. Click on the other one. See if we Piece of garbage. So, um, hi, welcome to my talk. My name is Mitchell Wong, and this is going to be music that binds a game in the world. And what I mean by that is that um, you might all appreciate game music uh, or music just in general. I've only met a single person who doesn't listen to music, and I don't know how they do that. But uh, in general, you might be like, yeah, music's nice, but it can be more than just nice, it can actually be functional and help support your game's world and world building and all that stuff and fun things. First, I'd like to apologize that I'm kind of sick, so I've been coughing a lot and I hate it. Secondly, um, some of the volume is inconsistent, so I'll try not to blow out your ears. Um, so first, who am I? Uh, my name is Mitchell, and I'm a composer, sound designer, and bass trombonist. Most people don't care about the last part. Uh, and I am working on a couple games around here, most notably Kind. Here I am with Gwen. Uh, she's cool. Hi, Gwen. Um, we're at EGX in Britain, and that is like PAX, but British. And uh, there's also Chibi Sue's Costume Combat, which is another Boston local game that's with Chris Bray. I'm also a cool organizer of Game Audio Boston. I have this cool t-shirt. You should come hang out with us on Tuesday nights, last of the month. And uh, yeah, that's basically all that's important. So yeah, KK Rule is the best. Um, why do we have music? So. Yeah, it can sound nice, but it also helps establish the tone and themes of the game. There's like the obvious stuff like sad music when you're sad, happy music that's happy, exciting, combat, whatever. So, um, but also having a cohesive identity helps make the game more memorable. So here we have a couple of fighting games in Persona 5, and these games are all known specifically for their soundtracks. So Street Fighter Third Strike has a sweet hip hop soundtrack. Persona has acid, jazz, and funk, and Guilty Gear, super 90s metal soundtrack. Really great, and people tend to have really 
fond memories when they sort of think about these things. It just helps stick it in their minds. So, um, but let's talk about tone. If you don't, if you do know this place, don't spoil it. But if you don't, I want you to think about what is this place, why you're here, when you get here, what do you do here, and just kind of the purpose of this general area. I'll give you a moment to think about this. And now I'm just going to play the music that accompanies here. So if you do know, or if you don't know, this is uh, Traverse Town from Kingdom Hearts 1. I'm going to try and turn up the volume. So this is, as you can probably hear, really cozy music. This is the first major place that you end up in, in Kingdom Hearts. It's the hub world. It's where all the NPCs from Final Fantasy and Disney, oh, there's Scrooge McDuck, and he's hanging out with Tifa and Eris for some reason. Um, <laughs> and you buy your items, and you go shopping and all that stuff. You spend a lot of time here. It's really chill, and the music helps support the tone of this environment. So, let's see. Here is another example of stuff. Here's our very popular game, Celeste. And here's the original audio. Later, I'll play for you other audio because the cool guys at Power Up Audio, they just put out their FMOD stuff out there and they're like, hey, you can mess around with it. I love the voice sound effects for that. Um, but now we're going to hear it with Darkest Dungeon. We are chained here forever, you and I, at the end of the world. Free your hearts, <coughs> rouse the moon, and embrace the inevitable cosmic hideousness that lives within us all. So uh, I think it's really demonstra demonstrative of how uh, different audio can really nail the tone of what you're going for. And it can really change things based off of, of course, what it is doing. So um, what can a composer do for you? Now, having, uh, we're gonna get more into some cool stuff. This is all kind of general stuff that I think most of you kind of know about. So uh, there's like, unity bundle of like a buttload of music and everyone's got that sort of music and sure it covers all the stuff like your boss battles and your towns and your forests and your whatevers but there's a lot of things that um, a composer can just kind of craft into this game world and so obviously there's um, you know custom original music but there's one thing that I'm going to talk a lot about called layout motifs and what a layout motif is is that it's a musical idea that is associated with a person, place, thing, or idea. So a quick example is Lord of the Rings. The, uh, the ring theme is and every time you see Gollum freaking out about it, you hear that music, and every time Frodo is suffering, he's like, I want to go back to the Shire. You hear Lord of the Rings has a lot of it, and it's a great soundtrack that's consistent over like six movies, half of which didn't need to exist. Um, so, but wait, there's more. Uh, you can use uh, all sorts of musical stuff to have a direct effect on the narrative and lore, which we will go into more specifics as I go all throughout this. Um, and it can provide more depth to the world building, the culture, the people, the relationships of it. Um, and you can do foreshadowing, which is really neat. So narrative, uh, the really obvious thing that you can do with narrative is lyrics. So. In Bastion, it's a post-apocalyptic world, and basically no one's alive anymore. But as you're going through one of the levels, you hear someone singing. 
And you're like, whoa, what's going on? And as you approach closer, you hear her sing the words. Um, the I'm talking over the words because it's maybe in cloud spoilers. I also don't care how it is. That's his power cable. Yours? Yeah, this is his computer. Uh, where is the one that we had for projection here? I don't know. Sorry, why is the other laptop for projection is dying? Uh, this one. Yeah, okay. That's my power cable. <laughs> <laughs> that's my power cable. This is, I'm pretty sure this is my power cable. Because it's honking big. I don't know. So, yeah, this is mine for sure. All right. I'm sorry. They were pretty sure they had it here. All right. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Well, um, so what I was saying was that the lyrics of this song, so she's from another country, and the song is like a folk song of her country, and it actually talks about the big... Uh, divide between the two countries and how that's actually really related to what happened in the game. And so obviously lyrics can be used to support the world building, the narrative, the culture, and all that sort of things. Second picture here, if you don't recognize that, I don't know what, go play Portal, I guess. Um, but my favorite example of musical lyrics is uh, you can have a rap about all of your characters. Um, so. Uh, here's also kind of stuff that you probably know about, but here's specific examples of cultures, cultures and subcultures with very distinct musical ties to it. So earlier I showed you some games. They, uh, so Street Fighter does not require a hip-hop soundtrack. In fact, Third Strike and maybe like the other versions of Street Fighter 3, I don't know because they're bad, but uh, those other Street Fighter games don't have hip-hop. In fact, Street Fighter 4 has like really electronica soundtrack. Street Fighter 2 has like really distinct kind of world themes for all the countries, so like Chun Li's theme is super Chinese. Um, so with these games, Okami has a very, very, very Japanese theme, and it's got gorgeous brush style art, and of course it has to have very traditional Japanese music that accompanies it. Here you have Shamisen and the, sh sh the flute that I can't remember the name of. Um, Jet Set Radio has to have funk, hip hop, ska, punk music. As you're going around skating and vandalizing places with your sweet tags, and you get chased by really gun happy cops. And uh, Banner Saga, this is the loud one. Wow, yeah. So Banner Saga is really, really Norse, very Viking based. And uh, Austin Wintry had uh, everyone singing Icelandic to help kind of reflect that. Um, and he has this sort of old folk style. He asked people to play on their like worst instruments. So like, oh, like you have a nice violin, play on your like crappy student like child fourth grade violin if you can to make it sound just really folksy. And uh, that's some stuff. Now we're going to talk about some more specific things. Uh, you can use music to show a very different uh, contrast between places, similarities and differences. So the contrast uh, in Xenoblade, really, really, really cool game. If you don't know about the world, the planet that you're on is literally this giant titan thing. So a long ass time ago, there were two titans called the Bionis and the Mechonis. They were locked into combat. The Bionis lopped off the Mechonis' arm. The Mechonis stabbed the Bionis and they both fell into stasis for a bajillion years and the life grew on both of them. On the Bionis it's biological and the Mechonis it's mechanical. And you live on the Bionis' foot. It's like this weird but super cool world. So the battle music on the Bionis is by Yoko Shimomura. She did Kingdom Hearts. It sounds pretty standard JRPG battle music. And of course, because obviously you're gonna to go to the Mechonis, it has a completely different world. It's so foreign to everything that you knew about before.
So that's just one way to show the stark contrast between places. There's other games that do this as well, like Tales of Exilia has a very sort of Central Asian theme to it. And then you go to another world that has this weird, funky, like free jazz music to it. But the first time it plays it is like on an airship and it's really stressful and it's like, what the heck is happening? It's so uncomfortable. Um, but the real, the real reason why I wanted to give this talk is because uh, I actually think Ben Kirkhope is super dope. Um, so what we're going to talk about is the tools that he uses to reflect the relationships between places. So likewise, you can have very stark different things, but uh, in this, we're going to examine what remains the same and what remains, uh, what changes. So if you're going to break music down into super duper basic blocks, there's melody, which is the actual like melody that you would sing. So in this case, it's amazing grace, how... Um, that's all that's written. So that's the melody. Harmony is the supporting notes underneath it, like da-da-da, da-da-da. If I sang that out of context, you would have no idea that's Amazing Grace. But underneath Amazing Grace, it provides chord support and also just more depth to the music. Rhythm is the literal beats that it takes, so the bottom is da-da-da, da-da-da. And the texture is what's playing it. So on here, it says piano, but when I sing it, it's literally my voice. So the texture is voice. On here it says piano. So when we listen to the difference between DK Isles and the King K. Rule Isle, uh, we're going to hear what changes and what's different. Now, when you swim over, because it's literally just swimming across, the music will just fade out and phase in this version. So last time I gave this talk, I asked for volunteers to ask uh, which ones changed, and they got them both wrong. So I'm just gonna tell you. The melody is basically the same thing, but the harmony has changed from major to minor, because major is like, oh, it's nice and chill here at DK Isle. We, we have fun in the sun. And K. Rule is like, I'm gonna blow up your island. So that's why it's a bummer. So they changed it to minor, which is the harmony change. The rhythm is basically the same, because in fact, there's no like loading zone between these two places, or at least there's no obvious loading zone. So the music will just phase out and phase in these two versions. So it has to be the same tempo and more or less the rhythm. But the texture is different. Um, the first one has like a flute as a melody and like drums and it's all islandy. And the second one has like heavy plodding strings and bassoon. So that's just one way to demonstrate the similarities and differences between places. Now, uh, if you think DK is one thing, Banjo-Kazooie is just this to the extreme. So Banjo-Kazooie, fantastic game. Um, the, you would think that banjos and kazoos would be very, very prevalent in this game. And it is, but it's only really for the main characters. Whenever you hear themes for the main characters, you hear those instruments. The majority of the game is spent in Gruntilda's lair. She's the bad guy, she kidnaps your little sister because she's bad. Um, so in her lair, it's really big. There are the subworlds where you spend a lot of your time. Uh, one of which is called Treasure Trove Cove, which you see pictured here. And I'll get to that soon. So that's Grunty's lair. But as you approach the entrances to other worlds, like Treasure Trove Cove, it once again phases in 
a different version. <coughs> so, um, as you can see, this is uh, this is a very piratey based world, it's very tropical, and the music of this same Gruntilda's lair reflects this. There's like 10 different worlds, and there's also slightly different versions. So Grant Kirkhope wrote, wrote like 15 versions of the same song, which is ridiculous, but actually probably not as hard as it sounds. Um, because all he does is he swaps the texture. Instead of it being like bassoons and marimbas, it's now accordions and more accordion. Um, so as you approach these different worlds, you will get a different version. So the, the Winter Wonderland has like a very like sleigh bells version of that song and the desert one has a desert E version. But uh, now we go inside Treasure Trove Cove. This is the main theme of Treasure Trove Cove and you hear it pretty much all the time running around this place collecting your jiggies and your jinjos and your music notes. So that's Treasure Trove Cove. Now, if you see this sort of boat thing in the middle, that might not be super obvious, that's a boat. But in the middle, that's called the Salty Hippo. Uh, and you go towards there, the music will shift into this version. On that uh, boat, there's a crying hippo. And uh, he's sad because his gold is stuck underwater. And ironically, he can't swim because it's British humor. So you have to go and fetch his gold for him. So when you swim underwater, it changes to this version. So what's really cool, so here's one of those things that as a gamer, this is one of those things that you subconsciously feel underwater because the music now sounds underwater. I, I as like a, as a six year old was not like, oh, I see that he switches to the marimba to represent underwater music. No, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm underwater and I'm swimming. So as, at least I feel very affected by that. Now what's really cool is that when you're underwater, that's sort of a very consistent modifier throughout the entire game. Every time you're underwater, whatever song is playing switches to those instruments. So uh, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in Treasure Trove Cove or if you're out in Grunty's Lair or whatever. Uh, every song that has, every world that has water has an underwater version like that. Um, there's our, there's this boss fight. He sucks. Um, and it's basically, it's just the same song. So yeah, um, it just kind of ties the cohesion of this whole world. Um, you spend most of your time outdoors, but occasionally you go to smaller indoors areas. And the music, so there's loading zones between here. It's a lot chiller, it's slower. It's still the same song, just kind of shows that you're still within this greater world. And because there is at least one place that you're indoors and underwater, there's an underwater version of this song. That's kind of excessive, but to have basically a million versions of the same song, you are both demonstrating how kind of cohesive a world is, and depending on how you swap out the textures, the rhythms, and um, the harmony, you can get really different um, effects of what's going on. So like the indoor places, a lot chiller, a lot lighter with instrumentation, a lot slower. And uh, underwater, of course, you get very consistent uh, instrumentation for that. Um, so, but there's other things you can do. Like Crypt of the Necro Dancer has uh, one world that's fire and ice, and so there's only two versions of each of those songs. But that's still like a really cool way of showing the same thing but different thing kind of feel. Uh, now we're gonna get back to lay it motifs. Here's what's fun. Uh, Undertale is a really great game, and I will try not to spoil it. But uh, here is a song that is representative of this one character. You hear it very early on. Now, 
Now near the end of the game, you encounter another character. And uh, you hear... So this just kind of shows the, the very obvious tie between these two characters, and it's just reinforced by the music. Uh, this one is pretty in your face, and I think most people caught it, but there's a lot of stuff that Undertale does that a lot of people don't catch. Um, even people like me, where it's like literally my job to write music. So, so um, next I'm going to play for you uh, an area of music called the core. Listen to this specific line. So that's just the very beginning of it. Uh, at the end of that area, you fight a boss, um, and his boss music sounds like this. I did not catch that this was the core at first when I first played this. And it just kind of shows that he's the final defender of this one area, and he's the last thing standing between you and the next place to go. Um, now that song is pretty famous, it's called Death by Glamour, and that character uh, that you see, he has several other themes. So that one song has three different themes all tied up into one new song. Um, and the other two are pretty obvious, but this one I didn't catch, but it also just kind of solidifies that he is specifically of this place, and he's trying to hold his ground there. Um, so, now we can show the growth of a character. Uh, this is Ricky. He is kind of a goober, but uh, I'm going to actually point out a specific part of this song. Basically, the first time you meet him, you get mad culture shock, but also he's a goober, so listen to this part. So Ricky's the last guy to join your party, and um, he obviously jo goes on a big quest with you, but uh, little do you know that he's actually like 40 something and has like 20 kids. It's absurd. But at some point when he, like before he leaves, he is like tucking in all of his kids and like kissing them goodnight. And he's basically telling them like, that I gotta go do this, but I'll be back. And it's actually a really tender moment. So it's the same theme, same character, but you hear a different side of him. You see it that he's not just a doofus, but he's actually like, kind of wise and like a really good sort of adult figure um, and there are a lot of sort of tender kind of moments like this in the game. So that can just show you how can a character can develop or at least more of it just unfolds. Uh, now here's some fun things. Uh, first off, Battle of the Goddess uh, is the song from Skyward Sword and within like five minutes of the song getting put out, people immediately figured out that it was Zelda's lullaby backwards, which like, oh man, foreshadowing that Zelda's actually the embodiment of the goddess Hylia, who knew, who would have thought, like, oh wow, uh, Zelda. Uh, great game, but also like, not the most, like, lore in, well, it's actually got a lot of lore, but it's not like, really like, mind-blowing. Um, Undertale, again, um, there's a track really early on that you hear, and if you look at the soundtrack, it's called His Theme. Uh, you don't find out who he is for a really long time. I'm not going to tell you, because you should play the game. But what's really cool is uh, the first time I gave this talk, I didn't actually think about this, but someone brought it up to me. Um, in Bioshock Infinite, a lot of stuff happens. And I cannot spoil this game, because it would take me like 30 minutes to explain everything that happens. But if you didn't catch this, there's an uh, interesting scene where you have an intimate moment playing guitar and singing with uh, Elizabeth. So if you've played Bioshock Infinite, and you look back at this, and you're like, holy crap, this song is actually a huge foreshadowing. But I didn't catch that, because I'm like, oh, this is a interesting, unique moment that I did not expect, uh, and it's completely different from the rest of the game.
So that was kind of mind blowing. Like, holy crap, the song. Oh my God, it all makes sense now. But like, wow. Uh, little did I know actually when I was researching this that that's not the first time you hear the song. The first time you hear the song is actually the very beginning when you first enter Columbia, Columbus, Columbia. So um, I'm really caught up with the fact that this is parallel to Bioshock 1 when you first descend into Rapture and you hear Andrew Ryan talk about his economy politics and you see Rapture, this glorious city, completely submerged but also decrepit. But this is nice and also super religious. Um, but I didn't catch the fact that this song is Will the Circle Be Unbroken until you go back and you're like, oh my god, foreshadowing, that's crazy. suck to like be here yet unless you're <laughs> black <laughs> Take. yeah well, it's nice if you're white and like yeah really captured the themes i think that i think at least that moment is like really really nice and beautifully directed and like god there's so much to unpack there and um these examples of foreshadowing are kind of like weak, I'm gonna be honest, but like you could argue that Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time have like, there are a lot of songs that come back over and over, and like you learn warp songs and they like, they're representative of places that you'll go to later. Um, I'm just gonna play for you Clock Town. Uh, it's the main area of Majora's Mask, and if you for some reason don't know anything about Majora's Mask, um, the way the game works is that there is a big moon that is going to crash into the planet and three days. And so the first day, everyone is just kind of in denial. They're like, yeah, it's probably fine. But by the time it's the third day, the moon is super close and just creeping towards you. And the pace of the music really picks up. And it's just really, it's anxiety in audio form. <coughs> <coughs> so you could argue that this is like foreshadowing the moon crashing into the planet and everyone dying. Great game. Absolutely great, but so um, there, there's just so much that you can do with music. Uh, it doesn't just have to be like a theme and like this is the theme of your game and this is the water places theme and this is the ice places theme and this is the fireplaces theme. There's so much that you can do as you can clearly see. Uh, you can tie relationships of people, their places and things and whatnot. Uh, you can show the depth and characters uh, growing. You can show how the world is more than just a place, but there's all this life and it's breathed into it through the culture um, portrayed through the music. Um, if you're a composer, a really great way of doing this is that you can have recurring music. Uh, first of all, just having recurring stuff makes it more memorable, has a lasting impact on players, um, but having variants uh, really kind of changes up things and it's so it's still constant because it's the same theme and you realize that what it represents is still there but depending on the situation or the place or whatever things are now in a different context um and also if you're interested and you're like oh man i have a really cool narrative focused game or like really explorative focused game uh if you want to have some cool music that accompanies this bring a composer on sooner rather than later because you'll have a lot more time to experiment and try things out uh, Austin Wintry said that when he first was working on Journey, which he got a Grammy nomination for his soundtrack, uh, that game company uh, asked him to write some music for it, and then he wrote some really deserty music, and they're like, mm, I don't know about this. Um, and they talk about how it's really like about the, the journey itself. So then he wrote a new soundtrack, and they're like, oh, this is great, and they listen to the music while they're making the game, and they send him a new build, and they're like, oh man, what I wrote was like not good. And so he writes something like bigger and better and whatever. And he sends it to them, and you're like, oh, this is even better. And they make another build, and he sends it. Uh, and they send it back to him, and he's like, oh, man, what I wrote before, no, that wasn't good. And then I'm going to write some new stuff. And he said that this basically happened back and forth until Sony took the game and published it. 
Um, so the more time that someone has to really kind of explore the depth of the, the people and the world that is in the game, uh, the better. So that's kind of uh, a nice thing. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming to my talk. If you have any questions, I think we have some time for that. <laughs> any uh, questions? Um, you in the black sweater? Okay. Um, uh, oh. Oh. I, oh, I didn't say anything. Oh. oh. Okay. <laughs> what were you saying? No, I was just, uh, I was just thinking, um, so what, what do you think about, um, so in contrast to a song being within the game, like diegetically uh, uh, speaking, what about end credit songs? Like what, like, what do you think about those, um, like how do those complement um, the ones uh, within a game? Well, I mean, Portal has a song that literally summarizes the entire experience and it became a huge popular meme hit. Um, I think they're fine, and I think that a lot of times that if you do it right, you can have the credits song sort of put a ribbon on the entire game experience. So, uh, I don't know exactly what you're asking me about, but I think that you can use that as a, a good opportunity to write some good music that, again, just ties the experience together. Yeah, sort of like, um, like it just uh, creates uh, sort of a memorable experience in some way. Yeah. Um, and you, yeah, what were you, you going to ask? Um, I was going to ask if you have any advice for composers, I guess, or music producers, like inner or online music producers who um, don't know formal music, uh, but still want to compose for games. So uh, any kind of, uh, any advice you want specifically for composing? Like, I guess, is it possible? Like, I think it's possible, but like, is it, is it likely or worthwhile? I was not formally trained in composition. I went to school for music, and I know a lot about music, but I didn't actually go to school for composing, and then I started composing for games, and did game jams and whatnot. And uh, yeah, and now I, I work on a, some cool games. So I think if you write music, and you think things sound cool, and you wanna write it down, there's, there's nothing, I believe like anyone who wants to write music can write music. Yeah. So yeah, and then it's just a matter of making it actually happen. Yeah, I mean, chiptune music is super duper simple. It's all really just basic waveforms, and any synthesizer can make that. Yeah. And if chiptune music has lasted 30, oh my god, almost like 40 years now, oh, that's insane to think about, uh, then like, really, you could write whatever you want. You can write a single instrument, people write solo piano, and if you want to just write with a single synthesizer and a DAW, there's nothing, like, there's no limits. And if people want to say, like, that you can't do this or that, and that's crap. That's what I say, at least. Tom. Uh, so, like, as a composer, when you see, like, or hear trailers that have licensed music, um, things like that, like pop songs or whatever, does that upset you, or do you think there's, like, a place for that? No, I, I, so especially for trailers, uh, if trailers have licensed music, that's super normal. That's, like, I mean, you hear, like, uh, what, what's that Rolling Stones song, Give Me Shelter? You hear that in, like, every movie trailer. Uh, the, like, several games, Borderlands 2 and Arkham City, I think, use the, the heavy song. Uh, what is it? There's no, no Place for a Hero or something like that. Uh, and when it's done right, and it really establishes the mood and tone of things, I think it's fine. I'm not like, oh, God, they could have hired me to do my job and whatever, like, I don't know. Music's cool, so especially big companies that can hire or that can like buy out song rights for things like that. It's just uh, yeah, as long as it's done well. Uh, yeah, back there. So um, while you're developing the game and aren't really sure about the tone, um, one might imagine that you might use a temp score uh, for different things that you might find for free on Un Unity or whatever. Um, and there's mixed feelings about doing that uh, in the movie making business, and I wonder if you've experimented with that, found that it anchored you too much, or couldn't move past it. So, the question is about temp scores, in my opinion, on that, especially in games and stuff. I know that a lot of times, 
<coughs> Sorry. With temp scores, a lot of times the problem with in cinema that the director gets too attached to the temp score, which they can't use because it belongs to something else. And then the composer is like, uh, the director just wants me to write the track that they use for the temp score, but legally distinct. And that can be frustrating in itself. When it comes to games, um, the first thing is that um, game music has to loop, so you can't just find any old song. Um, and of course, if you're using like royalty-free music for your temp track, then like sometimes people just keep it in. But if they're really committed to like getting uh, original music and hiring a composer, uh, the way I feel about it is that people oftentimes will say, "Do whatever you want," and that's a dirty lie because if you write stuff, they'll be like, "Oh, that's cool, but not what I was thinking." Uh, well, please give me more examples. So a lot of times, actually. If they give me a reference track, or they give me a couple of tracks, and like, hey, I want the sort of idea, or the feel, or like the sort of instrumentation of these tracks, that can be helpful to go off of. But as long as the devs give the composers enough room to like breathe and explore and write their own stuff, instead of like being like, so like someone asked me to like, hey, can you write music kind of like Silent Hill 3? And I was like, okay, cool. Uh, but just letting you know that I'm gonna write music like Mitchell Wong, and I'm not going to be a second rate, I forgot the composer's name, Messiah Hill 3. But I'm not going to just copy their style and be them, but worse. I'm going to be me. So that's my take on it. Any other questions? Yep? Well, this is just a thought. Um, so, like, when it, comes to the, when it comes to developing the game first and then uh, deciding what the music is, does it... Does it depend, like, is it more like a case-by-case case, uh, sort of a decision, or is that like, um, like, is there a specific pattern that, that comes to that? Like, is it usually the, um, like, does it usually come with the music would be first, or is, like, does the idea uh, come together um, after? Like, um, I guess my question has to do more with the, uh, with the flow of the, the work and the communication amongst the, uh, the composer and the developer, um, such as, like, what's the story that they're trying to convey and how they want the music to be? Like, do they just, like, do they often pick the music, decide what the music is first, before deciding um, how the story's, uh, how that's going to intertwine with the, uh, the story, or is that just like, they, or do they just kind of play it more by ear? So, um, just to kind of repeat and maybe like condense that, uh, mm -hmm. I think you're asking like, what is the workflow relationship between the development of the game and when music comes into it, and also how soon does music become a factor? Uh, the answer to that is it depends, TM. Um, I think it, like, the developers are, have an idea of what their game is. And a lot of times, the idea of what the game is includes audio. Sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes they legitimately are just do whatever. Um, but um, I think it really comes to, and, and I think music really, comes down to when tone is trying to be nailed down. Uh, and in my opinion, the sooner a composer comes onto a project, the better, because they can have a much better idea. Also, just time is nice. Like, if you have no time to write a soundtrack, it's gonna be less good. Um, but I think when trying to nail down the tone, that's the hardest thing. That's like the, that's like the biggest thing for music. And um, that's usually a really early thing. So, I think when you have a, a firm idea of what the game is, and you have like at least a build and um, a, a, the tone and the, the whatever you're trying to do, I think once that's all nailed down, then music can come into play. But if you're like, if you're still in like the the rummaging phase of dev, and you're like, I don't know what we're making. Are we doing this? Are we doing that? And you like throw things together. Like, no, that's bad. And this, um, things can change super duper hard, um, but definitely don't wait until like near the end. I would say sooner, like too soon is better than too late. Dan. When, uh, <clears throat> when a developer approaches you to uh, do audio, um, do you normally like want to get in on actually like integrating the audio into the game itself? Or do you just create the themes and let them like test it out by putting the audio in? But like, how much like development integration do you usually uh, try to do? I assume as soon as possible. 
So, me personally, I don't know how to code for Jack. Um, and I, so this is actually really dependent on the person. A lot of people, like Maxime, the school guy over there, he, uh, he knows how to uh, implement stuff into Unity uh, by himself, unlike me, because I'm a dummy. But <coughs> I, like to, I like to be pretty hands-on when it comes to um, uh, like playing the game and testing it out myself, but I don't personally implement things. Um, especially sound designers, though. People who are like in sound design, a lot of them know how to implement stuff using middleware or even not middleware. They'll do it themselves, and you just kind of like give them the things to do, and they'll just do it. Uh, as a composer, I at least like to be very, I like to be in really good communication with the dev and like really get the idea of things, but I don't actually typically touch the, the building tools itself. But if they give me a build and like, hey, like, I put the music in the build, I'll test it out and like, I'll check things. Um, and I like to do that a lot, really. Sometimes it sounds bad and I need to fix it. So, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, back there. Yeah, so uh, you said that sometimes during the creative process or even the development process, you produce musical artifacts and then they don't want to go in that direction or you've evolved past it. I just wanted to ask the ratio between how much the music that you write is for that creative process uh, and kind of gets thrown away by the end result uh, and how much might actually make it to the end. Um, so far, Actually, most of what I write does not get thrown out. Uh, I will say that for Kine, that game has a very distinct set of rules for how the music is composed. And the very, the most basic thing I can say is that um, the bass line is consistent throughout the entire game and I have to write everything on top of that. So when I was first writing music, I was kind of experimenting with different ideas of how to do it. And the first thing I wrote I think was pretty good, but there's two things that I'm not satisfied with anymore. One was that it was actually just not tonally the same thing. It was maybe too light, just to keep it simple. Um, and I was like, okay, maybe I need a little bit more energy or oomph or whatever. Um, but the other thing was that the bass line was just way too hard to write several things on top of. So essentially, as much as it kind of sucks, you, I just had to scrap it. Um, and that doesn't make the song bad, and it doesn't make the song like useless. If anything, it was like a really good place to start. Uh, after that, I tried doing like a 12-bar blues because it's a lot easier to write things over. And then I hated it because it was way too short and way too simple and way too repetitive. So then I, I wrote something after that. And that is what is currently being used and is in the game. So um, I think the, the process of writing music and it going to waste, quote unquote waste, is that it happens, it happens. And sometimes it can be frustrating, but sometimes it's good. Like Austin Wintery, he wrote like probably at least four versions of that soundtrack and the final one got nominated for Grammy. And uh, that's fine. So as long as, as long as everyone's on the same page and as long as people realize that it, it's not a waste of time or work, as long as it's not like, like it's, as long as it's really clear that like things are changing or things are not quite settling in place. Uh, any other questions? As um, I think after this is lunch, so no one's gonna actively kick me out. Um, but if oh, you got another question. So I'm a freelance composer, and uh, I also do other things, like I teach trombone, and I help out at after school. There are some people out there who are 100% freelance in their life. I don't think that is a very common thing at all. I'm pretty sure most, like 99% of people who freelance have at least other forms of income. So I would say, it is definitely possible to become a sustainable composer and a sustainable sound designer by freelance because I know people who are, but also it's not at all shameful to have other forms of income. And sometimes the ratio will just have to be heavily in favor of one or the other. 
and that's okay. Thanks so much, Dan.